One of the most common questions that I see come up in the Ashes community is, how do I get started deck building in Ashes? And, well, it's kind of a complicated question, because deck building in Ashes is pretty unique, and every person is going to bring their own level of experience to the game. For some of you, Ashes may not be your first card game, and so you might have some preconceived notions about how deck building should work. Others of you may be completely new to card games, and so you have no idea where to begin. Whether you're new to card games or just new to Ashes, this video is intended to help lay a framework for you for deck building, to give you the basic fundamental skills that you need to make a deck in Ashes. It is not an exhaustive or definitive guide by any means. It's just there to help lay a foundation for you, so you can get started building decks, and you can get better with experience and time. This video follows an outline that I've made for deck building, and the outline will be posted in the description below so you can follow along if you want. I've broken the video up into two halves. The first half is going to be talking about just generic deck building skills, things that you need to know for building a deck in really any card game. The second half of the video covers the more Ashes specific stuff. So if you're a card game veteran and you're already pretty familiar with deck building, you can skip ahead to the Ashes part. I'm going to put timestamps for every section of the video below, so just skip ahead. One more thing before we begin. If you like this kind of content and if it was helpful for you, or if you have any questions, please leave a comment down below. And if you'd like to, leave a like and subscribe so you can be notified whenever new content is coming. It may seem like a really small gesture, but it actually helps a lot. All right, with that out of the way, let's get started. Step one, pick a starting point. The first step might seem kind of obvious, but you'd be surprised at how easy it can be to get lost in the process and begin building a deck without any real direction or goal. Picking a starting point ensures that you don't meander around aimlessly. There are two main methods to picking a starting point for your deck, building by archetype and building by theme. Starting with an archetype has the benefit of giving you a lot of direction. Every archetype, whether it's burn or mill or bypass or control, We'll discuss these more in detail later. They usually come with a predefined win condition for you to build towards. Archetypes often have certain cards or sets of cards associated with them, so picking an archetype as your starting point can sometimes give you a head start on which cards are important inclusions in your deck. Alternatively, you may decide that you want to build a deck around a certain card that you think is cool or a set of cards that have a unique synergy. I call this method building by theme. Picking a theme starting point can be a little bit more freeform than building by archetype, since you may not have a defined win condition or a clear direction to build with. Archetypes are recognizable and familiar, but theme decks can often develop into really unique and exciting new concepts. Step 2. Define your win condition. After you've picked your starting point for your deck, but before you begin to come up with the first draft, you need to ask a very important question. How does this deck win games? The answer to this question is called your win condition. It's very important that throughout the rest of the deck building process, your win condition is centric to the decision making on what cards to include or exclude. This will help your deck retain focus and be as consistent as possible. Usually, whether you start with a thematic concept or just pick an archetype, the starting point or main idea of your deck will also necessitate the deck's win condition. If you picked a thematic starting point and decided to build around a certain card or groups of cards, your win condition may be directly tied to the synergy between these cards or a certain combo. An example would be if you decided to build around Frostback Bear and Massive Growth. Your win condition is to get these massive damage swings in that your opponent may not be able to block because of the bear's ability. However, if you picked an archetype as your starting point, sometimes the win condition of the deck may be more generic and centered on a general strategy. For example, you may have decided that you really want to build a mill deck. In this case, the win condition is obvious and linked directly to the archetype itself. You want to discard cards from your opponent's deck until it is empty so that they die from fatigue damage. Step 3. Put together your skeleton. Now that you've picked a starting point for your deck and determined its win condition, it's time to put together the bare bones of your deck. Usually, this includes adding the cards that your deck's theme is built around and adding any auto-include cards for your deck or archetype. The cards that you include at this stage are generally going to be cards that you want three copies of, especially any combo or build-around pieces. There are some exceptions, especially when it comes to ready spells, but we'll go over that later in the video. Auto-include cards are cards that see play in nearly 100% of decks that are able to run them. 
but it depends on your chosen magic types and win condition. It's very important to have an open mind with this step, and not add handfuls of cards just because they are good. Sometimes even very good cards don't belong in every deck. Keep in mind your win condition and whether the card you are considering directly contributes to that win condition. Okay, here's an important side note about the first five. At some point during or between steps one through three, you're going to want to figure out what you want to include in your first five or your opening hand. Your first five is going to be central to everything your deck is trying to do, so it will likely be part of your skeleton and be a critical part of your win condition. Many players even choose the first five as the deck's starting point, before they even make any other decisions about which Phoenix Born to use or what core cards to include three copies of. We'll talk more about first five in depth later in the video. For now, just know that most players tend to build their decks around their first five, so it may be something you want to have in mind early on in the deck building process. Step four, fleshing out your deck. Once you've added the necessary cards your deck is themed around and any auto include cards, it's time to move on to the meat of deck building. It's at this point that you can really begin to get creative and make the deck your own. There are a lot of different methods that people use during this step. Some people prefer to add three copies of every card that they might want to run in the deck, and then work their way backwards by trimming the fat off the deck and removing cards from the list that aren't optimal. Others prefer to sort out the most optimal cards and quantities before adding them in the deck, and stop when they hit 30. You may have a whole other method of deck building and choosing cards. There's no right or wrong way to do this. It's all a matter of personal taste. There are a couple of important considerations to keep in mind at this step. First is to make sure that you are including the right amount of removal for your deck. Removal is a name for cards or abilities that neutralize your opponent's units either by destroying them, sometimes referred to as hard removal, or rendering them unusable, sometimes referred to as soft removal. Removal is usually quite important as it represents an answer to your opponent's threats that they can't see on the board and may not anticipate. There are two main flavors of removal single target and AOE, or area of effect. Single target removal focuses on destroying or neutralizing a single unit on the battlefield, usually a large threat. Examples of this are Fester and Steady Gaze. AOE removal deals with multiple threats on the battlefield in a single effect. Examples include Meteor or Neil. The right amount of removal for your deck depends on what kind of deck you're building and it's something that you might need to tweak as you play games and discover the kinds of threats that your deck is weak to. Another important consideration is how many units you can summon. Units and Ashes are divided into two groups, Conjurations and Allies. Conjurations take longer to summon as they usually are summoned by using ready spells called Summon Books. But the advantage is that they're able to be summoned every round as long as the book is unexhausted. Allies, on the other hand, are played from hand. They take less time to play since they don't need to have books played first, but when they are destroyed, they can't be used again unless you have a way to recur them from your discard pile. Most decks and ashes will have a healthy balance between conjurations and allies. Very few decks will focus solely on one type of unit over the other. And just like removal, it may take a bit of tweaking and testing to figure out what that balance is for your deck. All right, step five, meta considerations and tech cards. Now that you've built your deck's skeleton and fleshed it out a bit, you might find yourself coming down to the last few card slots and wondering what to fill the gaps with. It's at this point that you might want to consider adding some tech cards. Depending on the state of the meta and what you are likely to run up against in a given match, you may want to include some cards that aren't necessarily optimal for your deck but can shore up some weaknesses in specific matchups. Tech Cards and Ashes is an interesting point of discussion because the first five mechanic allows you to always be able to put tech cards into your opening hand at the start of the game. The implications of this are an advanced topic all on their own. For now, the important takeaway is to consider what types of strategies are most popular, or consider areas in which your deck may have some weaknesses, and consider dedicating a few slots to dealing with those matchups. Step 6. Ask Questions now, you should have a full deck list, or at least be closing in on a full deck list. It's at this point that we've come to one of the most important steps in the deck building process, asking questions. Look at your draft. Ask yourself, what are this deck's strengths? What are its weaknesses? What kind of matchups will this deck excel in? And what kind of matchups are going to be really difficult? What cards in this list are most likely to be dead draws? 
What does my best first five look like? And what alternative first five options do I have? Do I have enough removal? Do I have a good balance of units, both conjurations and allies? Do all of these cards support my win condition? Asking these questions of your deck before you take it out into testing can help deal with some potential problems before they arise. Keep in mind that the answers to many of these questions may change with testing. You might think that you have the appropriate amount of removal and then play five games and lose three of them and determine that you don't actually have quite enough. The point isn't to come out of this step with a perfect deck list. The point is to get yourself to think critically about each choice. Okay, so now we've come to the most fun part of the deck building process, testing. This is probably the most important step in the whole process. You'll need to play some games with this deck to properly test it. And while you're playing these games, you need to be thinking critically about your card choices. Given the first five mechanic, small deck sizes, and the length of games and ashes, I think a general good rule of thumb is to play two or three games with each new draft of your deck list. The idea here is not to make drastic changes after each game. Ask yourself questions after every match. Did this specific card perform up to expectations? Was I able to sufficiently control or pressure my opponent? Does my deck have enough ways to get damage through or deal with my opponent's threats? Was I able to consistently be able to pay for the cards I needed to with the dice spread that I have? Are there any cards in my list that never get played that might be too situational? Would the game have played out differently if I swapped this card for that card, and will that affect other matchups negatively or positively? It's very important to keep in mind that your first draft is probably never going to be perfect. Deck building is an iterative process. Very rarely will you throw together a new list and it will be wildly successful, go on a 10-0 win streak with no changes or variations. And even if it does, you need to ask yourself, why is it winning, and whether or not there's room for improvement. After you've successfully tested your first draft, you can go back to deck building and improve. Then, you can test the second draft, and rinse and repeat. By the time you've reached your third or fourth draft, you will have tested this idea through about 10-12 to 12 games and have a pretty good feel on how the deck can perform in a competitive environment. But not every deck will perform well or work the way you envisioned, which leads us to the final step. Step eight, kill your darlings. This is the hardest part of the deck building process. You need to be able to know when to hang up an idea for a later time and when to go back to the drawing board. It can be very discouraging to work so hard on a list, to theorycraft and build and test exhaustively and play many, many matches only to come to the conclusion that your deck might not be up to standard. Here's the thing though, and it might be the most important thing you can learn from this video. Failure is an opportunity to learn. So you spent 10 hours drafting, testing, refining, and playing a deck concept that you adore only to find out it kind of sucks right now. Those weren't 10 hours of play wasted. You spent those 10 hours learning valuable lessons about deck building, lessons about what the meta's like, lessons about how to be a better player and be a better deck builder. Don't be afraid to pack up an idea and move on to something new. You can always return to new ideas later after new cards come out and the meta shifts. Don't be discouraged by a failed concept. Learn from that failure and take what you've learned with you into future endeavors. All right, here's a side note about net decking. This is something that's helped me tremendously in my deck building skills and something that was hard to swallow. There's no shame in net decking. For me personally, this was a very difficult lesson to learn. I'm very much the kind of card gamer that loves to make new decks from scratch, explore unexplored territory, play off meta lists. I'm also very much the kind of player that wants to win with these off meta lists and strange concepts. When I finally decided to swallow my pride a bit and start playing with other people's tried and true deck lists, lists that have been polished and optimized by some of the best players in the game, I started to become much more familiar with what makes good decks tick. Net decking optimized lists not only helps me understand the meta, become a better player, but it helped me become a better deck builder too. Don't neglect net decking as part of the deck building process, and realize that even if you take a top tier list off the internet and tweak it to make it your own, it's something unique and special. Maybe your list looks 95% similar to a list from Matt Bowers or Red King. That's fine, because the other 5% is something that could easily set your list apart and make it something special and unique. At the very least, it'll be something that feels special to you. And that's the most important thing, that you have fun playing decks that you assembled. Okay, so now that we've gone through the entire outline and you're familiar with the deck building process, it's time to talk about some Ashes-specific things to consider when building decks. Let's start with your choice of Phoenixborn. 
If you're coming from other card games, you might find it intuitive to start building your deck with a Phoenixborn. Your choice of Phoenixborn can have some rather large implications about how you construct the rest of your list, such as your spellboard and battlefield limits, and whether or not your Phoenixborn ability or signature card is tied to a specific magic type. So in many ways, it makes sense to start your deck building process here, and that's how I would recommend new players begin. However, it should be noted that the majority of Phoenixborn do not have abilities or signature cards that lock you into a specific school of magic. In fact, only 10 of the 22 available Phoenixborn at the time of this video actually demand a specific magic type, and some of those only lock you in if you choose to include their signature card. So, depending on the type of deck you're building and your color choices, you may sometimes have an option of multiple different Phoenixborn to use. This means that you can build most of a deck before even making a choice on which Phoenixborn you want. Also, like I mentioned earlier, including a Phoenixborn signature spell is optional. Maoni's Silver Snake Conjuration is fantastic, but you don't have to build a Maoni deck with Silver Snakes. If you choose not to use them, you're no longer locked into Nature and Charm, which opens up a very large amount of the card pool that may have been difficult to include before. One of the most important things to take note of when choosing a Phoenixborn are their spellboard and battlefield limits. Generally speaking, a Phoenixborn with a small battlefield will tend to focus on bigger or more resilient units at the expense of summoning less units overall. This is what many people refer to as going tall. Phoenixborn with much larger battlefields can afford to play cards that summon multiple units with a single ability or card. These units usually aren't as big or resilient, but they can be threatening in large numbers. This is often called a swarm strategy, or going wide. This is just a rule of thumb though. Rimia's signature ally is a card that creates 3 units on play, and she only has a battlefield of 4, which is the lowest stat you can have. The important takeaway here is to consider your battlefield when you think about what type of deck you're building, or what cards you want to include. It might be difficult to play Summon Sleeping Widows and Raptor Herder in a deck like Maoni or Astrea, and you might be leaving too much on the table by playing a Voltron-style Going Tall deck in Koji. Another rule of thumb is that a Phoenixborn with a smaller spellboard is generally speaking going to want more allies than a Phoenixborn with a large spellboard. Less ready spell slots means less slots to dedicate to summon books, which means you may need to compensate by including more allies to make sure you can always have a solid battlefield presence. However, again, this is not a hard and fast rule. You could certainly get by with less allies if you dedicate all three of your spellboard slots in Odette or Jericho to summon books. It might just mean that you have to sacrifice access to utility-ready spells in order to do so. Having a large spellboard, on the other hand, gives you a lot of flexibility with ready spells, and you may not mind having an augury taking up your spell slot and tutoring cards for you each turn if you have four more slots available at any given time. For beginner deck builders in Ashes, I recommend picking your Phoenixborn either during step 1 or after step 2 in the deck building outline. If you decide to build around a theme, and that theme includes a Phoenixborn, then start there. If you decide to build around an archetype, then I would determine your win condition and then pick a good Phoenixborn that suits that archetype and win con. Also for beginner deck builders, I highly recommend always including your Phoenixborn signature card in your deck lists. The number of copies can depend on what Phoenixborn you pick, but always try to work their signature card into your deck strategy. This will help familiarize yourself with the Phoenixborn's entire toolset and help you make more informed decisions in future builds. Also, you can always remove a signature card later if it's not performing the way you want. Alright, first five. The first five mechanic is a game-defining feature of Ashes, and it's also critically important for deck building. So much so, in fact, that most of the high-level players in the Ashes community recommend starting building deck with the first five. In many ways, your opening hand and your first round will determine the course of the rest of the match and so your first five will be centric to your win condition. This is the foundation upon which you'll build the rest of your deck. Now that's not to say that you must begin building your deck with your first five. Some people, like me, prefer to build most of a deck and then decide on first five options later. However, your first five does need to be a consideration throughout the deck building process. Most decks are looking to develop their spell board in the first round of the game, so many if not all of your ready spells will end up in your first five. Depending on the Phoenixborn you've chosen to play, this could mean as many as 3-5 to five ready spells in the first round. The other 1-2 to two slots are usually reserved for flex cards that can be swapped out for other cards in your deck depending on the matchup. It's very common to hear a reference to a first 4, and then have that 5th card be open to whatever the matchup requires. 
This is where a lot of the opening turn strategy of Ashes comes into play, and it can get quite advanced. We're not going to dive fully into teching your first five for specific matchups, because I think that's kind of beyond the scope of this video. Just know that you usually want to leave at least one slot in your first five open for a potential matchup specific card. And when you're building your deck, it's a good thing to keep in mind one of cards that you might want to include specifically to go in this flex slot should the need arise. One very important thing to keep in mind when deck building is to make sure that you can consistently spend all 10 of your dice in a turn. Resources do not carry over from round to round. If you don't spend a die in a turn, you don't get an extra die next turn. You generally want to end your turns without any unspent resources to maximize your efficiency. This is true at every stage of the game, but it's especially important in the first turn. For this reason, it's really important when deciding on your first five that you count and make sure that you can both afford all of your cards and abilities and that you don't have any dice left over. One last note on the first five. There is a recovery phase at the start of the first round of play, which means you can discard cards from your first five and draw up to hand size before the first action phase. This means that if you have the means to recur cards from your discard pile, such as like a ceremonial power die, then you can technically have access to a first six in the first round, usually at the cost of some dice or health or both. It's a bit of an advanced tip, but it's something to keep in mind. Okay, let's talk about Spellboard. A Phoenix Board Spellboard is hugely important to the long-term strategy of any deck. Throughout each round of the Game of Ashes, your Spellboard represents a number of repeatable abilities that you can fall back on no matter what your hands look like from round two onward. For this reason, it's very important to think carefully about what you want your Spellboard to look like every game when building your deck. Generally speaking, every deck in Ashes is going to want some number of summon books. These are ready spells that allow you to summon conjuration units to the battlefield. These units tend to form the backbone of your deck's battlefield strategy, since they will always be available for you to use no matter what you end up drawing later in the game. Ashes is a very battlefield-centric game, so you need to be able to summon units every turn. And if you don't have any summon books, this leaves you very vulnerable to drawing the wrong amount of, or type of allies. Your spellboard tends to go hand in hand with your first five. The first round of a game of Ashes gives you the opportunity to shape your spellboard for the rest of the game. So it's usually beneficial to include many, if not all, of the ready spells that you want for your game in your first five. As for the number of copies of a ready spell, there's a general rule of thumb amongst Ashes veterans. One or three, never two. If you care about focusing a ready spell at all, or plan on using a ready spell more than once in a round, include three copies of that ready spell, because you'll be more likely to draw it. If you don't care about focusing it, or only plan to use it once per round, include only a single copy, and then first five that copy. Including only two copies of a ready spell is just begging for that second copy to be meditated off the top of the deck. There are exceptions, of course, like whether or not you're running Essence Druid or Resonance, but this is generally a good rule of thumb for deck building. One or three, never two. And lastly, some decks may choose to include more ready spells than they have spellboard slots. This is generally referred to as overloading your spellboard. Either some ready spells will be swapped in or out as meta or tech choices in their first five, or you may choose to overwrite ready spells later in the game by meditating away all the spells in a slot on your spellboard to make room for the new ready spell. When you're nearing the card limit on your deck, it's important to look at all of your cards and think about whether or not you may want to include any dice fixing cards. If you notice that you have many cards that have power dice costs, it may be a good idea to include a couple of copies of a dice fixer. Now, which dice fixer to pick will depend largely on your deck, magic types, and your Phoenix Morn. Some dice fixers are ready spells and thus require a spellboard slot. Others are action spells. Some even have specific requirements like destroying a unit you control, which could have some nice energy if you're running a lot of cards that have on death effects. However, you may decide to not run dice fixing at all and live on the edge. Just meditate for all your dice fixing needs. Just keep in mind that the cost of heavy meditation could change depending on your deck construction and on the matchup. If you have a lot of single copies of cards in your deck, then meditating might mean losing access to some of those cards. If you're playing against a mill deck, the meditation is going to accelerate their win condition. There's no one-size-fits-all answer to dice fixers, so I recommend testing out a deck a few times and then making decisions based on what you notice in those games.
Choosing a dice spread is usually the last step in building an Ashes deck. After you've chosen all your cards, you need to look through the cost of those cards and make a decision on how many of each color of dice to use. This can be tricky, and there may be times when a draft of a deck list is struggling in the first couple of test games because of a poor dice spread. As always, the most simple answer here is to just test your decks and make changes based on what you see. Most of your dice spread needs will be dictated by your spell board. These are abilities that you generally plan on using throughout the entire game, so making sure that you have enough of a dice of a specific type to use that ability each turn will influence your spread. One technique that I often see is to lay out all the cards in your deck and count up the total number of each type of symbol you see. The highest total should get the biggest share of your dice spread, and the next highest total a little bit less than that, etc. etc. For example, my Jessa deck has 16 ceremony symbols, 13 nature symbols, and 7 divine symbols amongst cards in my deck. A good dice spread for this deck might be 5 ceremony, 3 nature, and 2 divine. However, while that's a good place to start, you also need to take into account how often you might expect to need many of the same type of dice in a single round. For instance, if I want to summon both a Frostback Bear and a Sarasaurus Mount, then with this dice spread, I won't have enough nature dice to play a Molten Gold. For that reason, I changed the dice spread to 4 Ceremony, 4 Nature, and 2 Divine. Now, there's no real limit to the number of magic types that you can run in a deck. And Ashes Reborn is more flexible than most games in this regard, due to always having 10 resources to spend each round no matter what. It's not uncommon to see 4 or even 5 color decks, and I've heard of success being found in even more colors than that. However, the more colors that you include in your deck, the more you might need to lean into basic dice costs to be able to smooth out your turns. If you're running a 5 color list, even if you have two nature dice in your spread, it may be difficult to include something like Molten Gold or Frost Fang. What if you need to use one of those nature dice for its power side to kill a unit? Now you're unable to play these cards that have higher nature requirements. It's also important to note that some decks may want to run a single die in a color just for its dice power, and not really include any cards in their deck that use that magic type. Maybe you run a single divine die in your Xander deck just for his Phoenixborn ability. This isn't uncommon at all, and in fact, it can be quite versatile. Okay, here's some notes on card draw and tutoring. As you continue to play Ashes, you may notice that some effects that are usually very strong in other games aren't quite as strong here. Two that stand out right away are card draw and tutoring effects. Because you draw up to your full hand size at the beginning of each round, and because the number of resources you have access to in each round of the game is fixed, Drawing cards tends to be a bit of an underwhelming effect in Ashes. Most card draw effects carry a bit of a steep cost, both in dice and deck building slots. Cards like Sleight of Hand may seem strong if you're coming from a different game, but in Ashes, spending two dice in a card slot to net two cards is a heavy cost. You may not even be able to afford to play what you've drawn. For that reason, many times the most popular cards that have draw abilities tend to be cards that give you value in some other way. Cards like Ironworker, which has a respectable 2-2 body and increases your effective hand size. Tutoring is another ability that is incredibly strong in most card games, but in Ashes, it can be only so-so. The first five mechanic guarantees that you can have any five cards you want at the start of every game. That's already most of the tutoring that a deck might need. Also, the small deck size in Ashes means that you can generally draw into what you're looking for and that it's better to just include more copies of a card if you want to see it earlier. That said, some tutoring cards like Augury can still be quite strong and do see play. Alright, for the final part of this video, I'm going to briefly go over the five basic deck archetypes that are common in Ashes Reborn. This information comes courtesy of Skak's excellent article, Archetypal Strategies in Ashes Reborn, which I will link to in the video description. First up, we have Swing Decks. Swing decks tend to focus on dealing damage to the opponent's Phoenixborn primarily through unit attacks. These attacks generally focus either on swinging around an opponent's blockers by going wider than their board, or swinging through an opponent's blockers by dealing damage with overkill. Swing decks also try to take advantage of holes in their opponent's defense by using removal to create openings for their units to attack a Phoenixborn directly. This archetype is one of the most common that you'll see, and it can kind of be described as playing good stuff Ashes. One example of a swing deck would be 4 Book Aridel. 
bypass decks are similar to swing decks in that they are dealing the majority of their damage through unit attacks. However, instead of building a wide board to swing around, or using overkill and removal to swing through, bypass decks use abilities like terrifying, gigantic, and bypass in combination with a single large threat to deal a ton of damage all at once that the opponent cannot effectively block. A Mioni Silver Snake deck is the prime example of this archetype, although this strategy is common elsewhere. Burn is an archetype that is focused heavily on dealing as much direct damage to the Phoenix Worn as possible through various spells and unit and Phoenix Worn abilities. They only care about the board in so much as that they need to effectively hold off the opponent from dealing damage faster than they can deal damage. The primary goal is to stall their opponent long enough to win by direct damage. Brennan Burn with Fire Archers, Frostbite, and Molten Gold is a good example of this archetype. Mill is an archetype with a lot of support in Ashes, and it makes sense why. Deck sizes in this game are small, and players naturally will mill themselves to an extent with meditation. A mill deck's goal is to stall and utilize a strong removal suite alongside many discard effects in order to drive their opponent to begin taking fatigue damage as fast as possible. This strategy can be quite strong in the right hands. Control is probably the least defined archetype in Ashes as it doesn't really have a direct win condition on its own. They utilize a wide range of powerful removal and stall effects, as well as resilient units to try and build incremental advantages over the course of a game and win via attrition. Since Ashes games tend to not go very many rounds, on average 2-3, to three, playing for the long game with incremental advantages tends to lose out to decks with higher tempo strategies. As such, control is an archetype that leans heavily into swing, burn, mill, or some combination of the three for its win condition. All right, that pretty much covers everything. Uh, again, this video is not a definitive or exhaustive guide. It doesn't cover a bunch of advanced topics. It's really just there to give you a foundation, a framework to get you started building decks and ashes. So if there's some things that I missed or things that you wish I would have covered in more detail, let me know in the comments. I'm definitely open to making a follow-up video in the future that goes into some more advanced topics. So if you're interested in that, let me know. And again, if this content was helpful for you and you liked it, consider leaving a like and subscribing. You can hit the bell for notifications if you want to be notified when new content is coming out. As always, thank you so much for watching and supporting this channel. We'll see you next time.